Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to our webinar on digital banking and financial inclusion. Thank you for joining us um, on this very exciting topic. My name is Ivo Yenik. I am financial sector specialist at the consultative group to assist the poor, also known as CGAP. And I'm joined today by Sean de Montfort, consultant to CGAP and also second D from the Financial Conduct Authority in the United Kingdom. Hello, Sean. Good morning, Ivo, and good morning, everyone. So today we're going to talk about digital banking and financial inclusion. And what we really want to do in the next 40 minutes or so is to go over why we talk about digital banking and the combination with financial inclusion. What do we mean by digital banking? What we see happening in digital banking? What kind of categories and business models are emerging in this area? How we believe digital banking can potentially deliver or improve financial inclusion. We also want to talk about some specific examples, business models and businesses that are doing things that are worth attention perhaps and, 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 and further analysis because they might be particularly interesting for financial inclusion efforts. And then we'll, we'll give you also an overview of uh, what's gonna happen next. After those 40 minutes, uh, we would like to open this session for, for questions and answers. So because this is a webinar, uh, let me go very quickly over a couple of logistics so that you know what to expect. Um, this is an audio broadcast. Uh, all of you and your microphones will remain muted during the entire webinar session. So to ask questions during the webinar, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your WebEx window. Um, submit your questions at any time during the presentation. You don't need to wait until end. We'll answer them during the Q&A session, as I mentioned. To ensure that we can see the questions, but also other participants can see the questions, please select all participants when sending your question. And then important point, a recording of the webinar will be emailed to all attendees and registrants and will be also posted online. So, let me start with the question why we're talking about digital banking and financial inclusion. Well, retail banking has become a hot topic over the last few years, both in developed and developing markets, with a lot of news articles and reports coming out every day. The boundaries of the sector has also become fairly amorphous with fintech and technology more broadly, making the question of what makes a bank a bank more complex than it ever has been before. But does this change that the banking industry is undergoing um, have anything to do with, with financial inclusion? So let's have a look at some data first, and we can't start anywhere but with FinDEX data. So financial institution accounts, and this is largely bank accounts, have fueled growth in account ownership since 2011 all around the world, but we still see that emerging markets and developing economies are still lagging behind. And are we finding that to be equally distributed across the EMDs? Well, that's certainly the case, but if we look at the map from FinDEX data, we see that you know, Africa is particularly uh, lagging behind. So let's use Africa as an example where we can zoom in and, and uh, uh, have a closer look to their banking industry. So perhaps surprisingly, African banking market is considered to be the second fastest growing banking, uh, banking sector in the whole world, and also the second most profitable. In the same time though, it's also among the least efficient ones. And it looks from that graph on the, on the left-hand side that the cost to income ratio is actually falling in Africa. Yeah, that's interesting, it is indeed, but then when you look at the, the margins, um, it's largely due to increasing margins. It's not necessarily due to cost efficiencies or Im improving the other cost-related matrices. So, for instance, when we look at the cost to asset ratio, we see that Africa is quite above the, the, the global average. In fact, African banks have the second highest cost to asset ratio in the whole world. And why is it so high? Well, it's probably for a number of reasons, um, but 
here are a few. So this is due to reliance on manual processes, uh, poor pro frontline productivity, access to head office, back office costs. A lot of these things can be changed by, by implementing a technology. And so there is a great opportunity um, that could be uh, leveraged by implementing technology. So really, it's no wonder that mobile money is dominating financial inclusion uh, in Africa today. Yeah. So, techno so digital technology is really changing the, the fundamentals of financial services around the world. And we can sort of divide that into three different uh, components. We look at digital interfaces. So we're seeing lower cost and increasing, uh, which increases scalability for providers. We're seeing uh, better customer value in terms of visual and interactive interfaces. And this enables in the disintermediation of incumbents uh, as well as the rebundling of products too. Secondly, we're looking at digital production systems. So for example, cloud computing, as well as distribution channels, apps, marketplaces, and so on, which will reduce the barriers to entry and also lower switching costs for consumers. And then finally, the third piece is this data-driven business model. So data is playing an increasing, increasingly fundamental role in, in, in financial services business models, and this creates a new source of uh, competitive advantage as well as new partnership dynamics. And all of this sort of bundled together enables startups to deploy at a lower cost and to scale much more quickly than was possible previously. And this also puts customers within the reach of powerful uh, new challenges like the big techs and so on, and changes customer expectations about service, access, transparency, customization, et cetera, all of which gives rise to new business models where incumbent banks are not necessarily best, best uh, positioned to compete. Yep, the financial services are, are changing dramatically, and uh, uh, technology plays an important part. But what about banking specifically? Yeah, it's a good point. And banking uh, is equally touched by these, by these fundamental changes, too. So if we look at the consumer side, we're seeing customers have an increasing range of financial tools at their disposal and, uh, and increasingly using different providers uh, for different products. So gone are the days where one person had one financial services relationship. So each financial product or service is almost a component that each customer assembled into a different configuration to suit their specific individual needs. So for example, in payments, here in the US, uh, people historically would use, for example, a Chase Visa card to swipe everywhere. And now today, there are a much broader range of payment options. And of course, that applies in the EMDs too. But this isn't just a payment story. Uh, it, it goes much more broadly and touches every single element of, of banking uh, products and services. Then on the production side, it's a similar story. So at the back end, financial tools themselves are becoming uh, disassembled into different component parts where uh, banks uh, and digital banking providers plug in third parties with their <clears throat> that are able to provide a niche uh, specialized uh, expertise within the, the banking value chain. Yeah, indeed, banking is undergoing, undergoing this big change as, as well, and um, many are trying to guess the future of banking. Absolutely. It's become uh, the topic of the day with, with regulators, for example, the FCA in the UK, consultancies such as McKinsey and many others, Standard setting bodies, for example, Basel's uh, Committee on Banking Standards, all predicting what the, uh, the future of retail banking might be in the years to come. We're hearing a lot of um, uh, speculation about will bank, because banks become a utility, a marketplace, a platform, a service, uh, and others who, who believe there'll be little system systemic change. There's also a lot of debate around who's going to win this competition. Will it be incumbent evolution or fintech revolution? But despite all of this hype, for us at CGAP, there's one fundamental question. And that is, can digitization make banking more relevant to excluded and underserved customers in Africa and in other EMDs? Well, yes, and uh, there are some data that suggest that it actually may be the case. Uh, for example, EY estimates that it's 200 billion that can be uh, incremental annual revenue generated by banks if they use technology to better serve the financially excluded customer segments. And this is due to a number of reasons, and here are just some examples. Um, first of all, by implementing technology and, and going digital, uh, banks can limit their physical infrastructure, mostly branches, and reduce the fixed costs. Also, technology allows for a flexible, scalable, very often cloud-based IT systems that reduce their operational costs, but also makes 
bank more nimble and uh, more flexible in serving particle customer needs. Um, then there is a, another uh, issue with partnerships, which partnerships and open systems are less costly, less time consuming, they're offering new capabilities and again allow banks to be nimble, flexible and more responsive to needs of customers that are currently outside of their, uh, of their focus. And another example, um, using uh, data analytics such as machine learning and artificial in intelligence in different ways can again increase efficiencies, for example, pre-approving credit products using uh, alternative data credit scoring mechanisms can save costs for traditional manual individual credit assessment as one example, which allows providers to serve more clients. So we used all of this context and evidence to create a, a hypothesis at the start of our project. And that hypothesis can really be broken down into three core parts. The first of which is that the digitization of banking leads to operational improvements and efficiency gains, as outlined by Evo on the previous slide. And that these efficiency gains and, improve, and operational improvements can position digital banks to better serve excluded and underserved customers. And that that in turn will, uh, that, that some business models within the digital banking space will be better positioned and indeed more willing to serve those excluded and underserved customers. And it's our project to try and identify those business models. All right, so let's take a step back now and let's try to explain what we actually mean by digital banking here because it's a relatively big and vague term, so I think it's worth um, doing this exercise. When we started this project uh, a couple of months ago, we, we tried to boil the ocean. So we literally look across a variety of providers, different types of business models, and we try to uh, channel them through multiple filters, do a, a multiple triaging exercise, just to come up with uh, some basic taxonomy that would work for us. And so we finally arrived um, at the four big categories of digital banks or digital bank business models, uh, which we're going to talk about in more detail uh, using the business model canvas developed uh, by SIGA. But just to give you an overview, it's a fully digital retail bank, limited purpose bank, marketplace bank, and then banking as a service. So let's have a look at, at each and uh, let's have a look at some examples as well. Yeah, so starting with the fully digital retail bank. Uh, so this is a full service bank uh, for retail or, or MSME customers that uses broadly a traditional banking business model, but fundamentally they use a modern operational model with much, which can also create a better customer experience and, and, and additional customer value compared to uh, traditional banking. So these firms were built from the ground up uh, for the digital world and typically have no or, or few branches. So some might be greenfield startups, others offshoots from incumbent banks. Uh, the business model and core revenue model is broadly aligned with a traditional, with a traditional bank, but as I say, the operational improvement, the operational model is fundamentally different. Uh, and the target market is, is uh, SME mass market or, or, or retail mass market. They're typically regulated in the same way as a, a conventional bank too. Yeah, and so this is a big category of, um, of digital retail banks, but we see some types or variations of this fully digital retail bank. And here are the three major variations that, that we see. First, we decided to call it digital brand. It's a greenfield bank launched as an offshoot from a parent incumbent bank, typically targeting a middle income customer. It can be a separate entity, but it also can be just a, a separately branded product line. Um, they're typically launched either in the same market as the one that a parent bank operates in or as a means of entering a new market or new customer segment. The second type or variation is digitized incumbents. It's really the case of incumbents or existing licensed bank, traditional banks now uh, venturing full speed into the digital world and changing their processes dramatically so that they are becoming a digital, uh, digital player. And finally, we have a digital native challengers, banks that have been established from scratch as fully digital, appealing to the digital, digital uh, customers and trying to challenge the traditional uh, banks. And to give an example of a fully digital retail bank uh, in, in an emerging market in this case, is to, uh, we have Time Bank, um, who started as a remittance 
provider in South Africa, and they launched a, a banking um, product line in 2019. And they now have over 100,000 banking customers. One of the very interesting things about Time Bank is their distribution model. So they partnered with a supermarket chain in South Africa called Pick and Pay, uh, who have around 750 stores across the country, uh, with uh, a high, high presence in rural areas as well. Um, they've installed kiosks in each of these pick and pay stores that cost around one or two percent of the cost of running a, a traditional brick and mortar branch in South Africa. So it's low cost, and uh, they also offer generous sort of incremental savings rates to, to customers, uh, all within a context of quite an expensive banking environment within South Africa. So, and Timer uh, also looking to expand into a credit product line in, in the near future. All right, the second category we have here is banking as a service. So we're talking about companies that often would describe themselves as a technology companies that provide elements of the banking value chain as an end-to-end -end B2B or sometimes B2B2C service. Uh, their target segment is typically fintech startups, uh, fully digital retail banks, digital consumer companies, which they enable to focus on their core value while providing sort of the rails for their business, so the backend solutions very often. Um, customers can then deploy a banking solution instantly without the time necessary to build solutions in-house, and that has allowed many players to get to the market much faster than what would be possible previously without BAS. Um, the revenue they typically get, get from pay-per-use fees, uh, they get uh, revenue from monthly subscriptions or white-label solutions. Um, sometimes revenues derived from product level revenue share, and some of the BAS providers are also providing their core services to uh, the end customers. In terms of regulation, they typically hold full banking license, and they offer financial service providers the suite of services that enable them, as I mentioned, to serve their customers. And we split this banking as a service category into two, uh, two smaller buckets. So first of all, there's software as a service, which are really tech companies that don't have a banking license, that partner with financial services providers to provide some back-end technology, technological solutions, either via APIs or, or done locally. Um, and this software is typically sold on a, on a subscription basis. We then have a license as a service category, which is a licensed bank that, that acts as a white-labeled infrastructure provider to uh, financial services providers at the front end. Uh, typically via, via APIs. So this involves the fin other fintechs or their, their clients leveraging the firm's banking license to offer bank accounts and other financial regulated financial products uh, on a B2B2C model. And this diagram just visualizes uh, the, the separation of, of those two categories quite clearly. So you can see the, the license as a service bucket offering the uh, banking license and balance sheet components. Uh, in addition to business the business process layer and, and possibly the core banking system, whereas the software as a service model would, would, would solely focus on the middle two. Yeah, and I find this layering actually very helpful. Um, it's a helpful way to visualize the different, um, different areas of services provided mm -hmm. uh, by, by BAS, but generally also visualize the structure of, of banking operations sometimes. And it largely corresponds to how one of our examples is structured with Fedor, um, where we have on one hand a Fedor bank that is bank serving, you know, the retail customers, but then we also have a Fedor Solutions, which is a, a banking as a service provider, and we also do have, or they do have actually, uh, Fedor Systems as a, as a technology company that develops um, specific technological solutions. So, uh, zooming in Fedor Solutions, um, they started as an extension of Fedor Bank, as I mentioned, in Germany and they hold a full EU uh, banking license, which allows them to passport in, in other EU members, member countries. Uh, they offer a comprehensive um, and modern digital banking solution, including the relevant regulatory permission on which uh, their, their clients can, can write, so to speak. Um, the offer includes current account cards, omnichannel front end, customer service, uh, credit risk scoring, open banking APIs, and marketplace pre-populated by, by fintech partners. Um, among others, Fidor powers O2 banking in Germany, uh, Banksy, which is the first digital retail bank in Algeria, and, and, and others. And when you look at the map uh, below, we have some, some other examples, but there are 
far more of the, the banking as a service providers around, around the whole world. So our third category is the limited purpose bank. So these are really monoline <clears throat> financial services providers that offer uh, a specialized banking products or services. So either a niche product to a mass segment, a standard or typical product uh, to a niche segment that would not be able to access that product type otherwise. And thirdly, a sort of uh, personal financial management aggregation over the top layer that can be embedded into, into a wider uh, bank to banking value chain. So these products and services are primarily offered on a, on a B2C basis, and, and the customers are, are largely digital natives. Um, so they're not licensed as a bank, but they may hold an e-money payment or, or other non-banking license uh, uh, too. So what are the categories of this limited purpose bank, as we call it for now? Um, one big, big category or variation is personal finance management tools. Um, but this is generally providers who offer some additional services uh, that help their customers to manage their finance better. So dashboards or, or ways to save money uh, to sort of control one's behavior so that the good, good financial service customer behavior is nudged through different tools. These would be the examples. Um, I would say that some of those new categories that have been established by the Payment Service Directive number two in Europe would fall under this category. So um, account information service provider, for example. Mm -hmm. Then we have a niche product provider, um, which is a provider that focuses on an offering of a single niche financial product or service to a mass market. Um, example here is Tomorrow, which is basically a green banking, in quotes, um, offering uh, a service, um, let's say, ecological friendly, uh, financial services. And then we have a third category, which is niche segment provider. So provider that has a standard product or service that is typically in incorporated into the offerings of retail banks, but that is now being offered to a niche customer segment, a specific mm -hmm. market. And we have example of Moniz um, that offers basic transactional accounts, among other things, to immigrant population in a number of countries. And talking through these three categories, it doesn't sound like any of them are actually banks. Yeah, that's right. It's spot on. Um, these are typically not licensed as a bank, and we are still debating whether a uh, limited purpose bank is the right way to, to, to uh, call this category. Perhaps we may talk about limited purpose non-bank providers or something around, around mm -hmm. this. So an example of, of a limited purpose bank uh, or, or non-bank uh, provider, as you might call it, as PiggyVest in Nigeria. So PiggyVest is, is a Nigerian online savings platform that allows their customers to automatically save a small amount of money periodically. They've got over 200,000 registered customers with uh, savings over uh, uh, 2.78 million US dollars. Interest paid daily and customers can set specific targets or group goals. Uh, and also they've recently announced a partnership with Avon Healthcare to provide health insurance to their customers. So, it's interesting that they're making a little bit of a movement into a sort of partnership slash marketplace type play. Yeah, marketplace. I'm glad that you mentioned it because this is perhaps the most talked about category out of the four. Um, marketplace is really the, this concept of providers trying to aggregate um, a different value propositions on one platform. And I would say it's a, an equivalent of a grocery store in the financial sector where I can go to one place and shop around and get services from a number of providers. So those marketplaces uh, or marketplace banks, as, as we call them here, um, they may be targeting both B2B and B2C, depending on their specific model. Uh, typically, the business logic is that they don't offer only their own product, but they actually plug in pro providers that offer a complementary additional product uh, so that they cover as wide spectrum as, as possible. And the revenue uh, they typically uh, get from um, the commission uh, revenue share, uh, commission on referrals, and it can be also combined with the revenue that is coming from their core value proposition because they still may be manufacturing some of the core financial service products. Now, when it comes to regulation, uh, it really depends, again, based on th the jurisdiction in which they operate, but also the specific business model. They may or may not hold a banking license. They may not even necessarily hold any, any specific financial service provider license. Mm -hmm. 
So we can divide this marketplace bank uh, uh, category into three broad uh, buckets. So first of all, we have a B2B marketplace. So this involves third-party platform commercializing the connection, a connection between a range of different FSPs uh, via APIs. So this could support with uh, credit assessment, payments, data aggregation, and, and a range of other services too. An example of this would be uh, FinServe in Kenya have, have a platform along those lines. Secondly, we have a limited uh, B2C marketplace. So this allows retail customers to take out a range of different financial services products uh, offered by an, an approved partner uh, on, the, on the marketplace bank via, via an API. So they typically acquire their customers through their own products or services, but then retain the customers through offering a, a fuller suite of products on the marketplace that fulfill a, a broader range of that customer's financial needs. Um, providers range could have a, a specific partner pro providers on the platform offering distinct products through to a more competitive uh, marketplace with multiple partners per product type. So then thirdly, we have the open B2C marketplace which is similar to the limited BTC marketplace, except that uh, there are many more providers, uh, many more uh, products and providers per product type. So Bank Bazaar in India, for example, might have hundreds or thousands of different uh, uh, providers on their platform, and it's not curated in the same way that a limited B2C marketplace might be. And really their objective is to drive as much traffic through the platform, uh, and that's their customer acquisition strategy rather than um, acquiring customers through their own uh, products and services. So a couple of examples and, and, and one in specific. Starling Bank in the UK. Um, Starling launched in the UK in 2014 with a digital native retail bank proposition. They now have 500,000 retail customers and 30,000 SME customers. Um, and they have since supplemented this with a marketplace offering uh, mortgages, pensions, insurance, investment funds, and also complementing this with uh, personal finance management tools and additional services offers for, offered for their SME clients. Um, so far, they have uh, 15 partners um, uh, on their marketplace. marketplace. Uh, but the overall idea is to create a marketplace where everybody who passes some due diligence, minimum due diligence requirements can actually offer their products on the Starlink uh, marketplace one day. So those are our four uh, overarching buckets, but of course it doesn't capture everything and there's much more uh, texture and variety uh, within, um, within the business, within the business, being digital banking business models. So for example, we've seen uh, many limited purpose banks migrate towards becoming fully digital retail, retail banks. So a good example of this would be Monzo uh, in the UK, but many others have too, and really this is because they want to scale as quickly as possible uh, and, and not have to wait until they got a banking license to, to, to provide their to fuller suite of products and services. We also see a dependency between the limited purpose bank and the marketplace bank, uh, where limited purpose banks very commonly or very often will, will sit on the marketplace as a means of uh, getting some exposure and, and, and getting the customer traffic that they need. Because they're a, a niche provider, they may struggle um, to, to get broad coverage uh, within the market otherwise. So raisins. Uh, is an example that, 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 that sits on many different marketplaces. We also see uh, limited purpose banks relying heavily on banking as a service providers, both for um, licensing, but also uh, with back-end solutions. You know, limited purpose banks might be quite small and it's very costly to build um, a lot of the back-end solutions um, in-house and relying on banking as a service provider can be very helpful in that regard. We're also finally seeing um, some providers combine one or two, two or three of these four buckets together in their business model. So Evo mentioned Starling in relation to its marketplace. They have a marketplace bank, but they also are a fully digital retail bank, and they also have a banking as a service um, arm as well, where they white label their own technology and solutions to um, third parties. Yes, so let's now focus on how can digital banking deliver financial inclusion and I'd like to remind you that you can send questions using the, the chat box on the right. Uh, just make sure that you're sending your questions to all participants so all of us can see what questions got asked. Uh, we will then go over the questions towards the end uh, during the Q&A session, um, seeing that a lot of the, those questions are addressing really big uh, issues of financial inclusion. Um, 
So we'll try to answer as many as, 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 as possible. Now, let's, let's zoom in on the connection between digital banking and financial inclusion. So to answer that question, we first need to understand the barriers to financial inclusion and the barriers both on the demand and on the supply side. Um, for now, we're using a framework that uh, was developed by SIGAP in 2015. Um, it's, a, it's a framework developed to inform uh, funders and donors interested in supporting financial inclusion initiatives. And we, we, we are tweaking this framework, so it's changing, but you know, for now, we thought it would uh, be a good framework to use where we can sort of uh, see what the barriers are and, and start sort of matching them with the financial inclusion aspects or, or the operational aspects of digital banks. So what we see on the demand side as the barriers or challenges to financial inclusion is lack of trust, um, cultural, social, and demographic factors that determine what customer needs, what customers need and what they want. Um, which means what kind of products are suitable for them and which, what kind of products are not. Then information asymmetry and awareness, the lack of understanding of what services are available and how they can uh, support certain needs in, in customers' lives. And uh, hand in hand with, with this goes limited financial capabilities and financial literacy. When we look at the demands uh, at the supply side, that is uh, the side of the providers, uh, there is also a handful of challenges. Limited institutional capacity, weak value proposition, lack of understanding of what, what customers need and how they can be uh, best served. So that translates into an uh, insufficient customer-centric approach. Uh, underdeveloped dev delivery channels, something very important, particularly in rural areas and, and remote areas where uh, traditional delivery channels known to banking are not working very well. Then limited understanding of market opportunities, generally limited incentives to innovate, and unfortunately in some of the markets also uh, sort of incentives to engage in predatory and irresponsible business practices. So the next step in this process was uh, looking at the digital banking business models uh, that, that we've explored and identifying the key operational improvements provided by those digital banking business models over traditional or non-digital models. We split those into the front end and the back end, as you can see on, on the screen. At the front end, we had the application of data, for instance, to develop customization of products, progressive lending, alternative credit scoring, and so on. Digital onboarding, so for instance, digital acquisition, uh, digital customer due diligence, electronic signatures, uh, and so on. Thirdly, the financial concierge. So this is uh, things like dashboards, uh, personal financial management tools that could either be automated or, or, or non-automated too. And at the back end, at a higher level, we had core banking platforms, uh, reg tech, and the integration with partners by APIs that uh, could indirectly be, be quite powerful. Yes, so can you tell us a little bit more about how this inclusion matchmaking works? <laughs> Absolutely. So this uh, visual uh, it sort of goes to explains the process we went through. Um, so it's really three steps. So firstly, we started with the barriers, which, which are the, those that Evo outlined earlier. Um, so for instance, uh, limited financial capabilities was one on, on the demand side. We then flipped that into an enabler. So what, what would we look for within a digital banking business model um, that could help to overcome that, that barrier. And we then drilled into the uh, digital banking features of, of the digital banking business models to identify which could be help facilitate that enabler um, uh, to overcome the barrier. So in this example, it could be uh, digital acquisition, segmentation of clients and customization, access to a national digital ID database, digital onboarding, and so on. Excellent. You can basically do it for all of these challenges and, and, and barriers, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. So in the next, in this visual, you can see uh, the output of going through that, that three-step process with each of the barriers. So on the left-hand side is the enablers, so the inverse of the barrier, and on the right-hand side is the digital banking features that we'd look for to facilitate that enabler. And then we repeated the same process, but, but on the supply side. So I'll, I'll very briefly, uh, the barrier predatory and irresponsible business practices, the enabler, Revenue streams are aligned with customer interests, and how could that happen? Well, through progressive lending, automated personal financial management, uh, potentially the use of APIs or alternative credit scoring. And once again, we created the same the same table um, 
is yeah along the same process. Yes, and basically why we did it, and you know, again, you will receive this presentation, so um, you would be able to go over this in more detail. We don't necessarily have time to do it right now, but what this helps us to do is to sort of uh, hypothesize even more about the impact of different business models on financial inclusion uh, based on what kind of characteristics they, they feature and how those characteristics are linked to financial inclusion barriers. And with this information in mind, we see two pathways for digital banking to potentially improve financial inclusion. The first one is the really direct one where we talk about digitization to serve excluded and underserved customer segments with providers that are building their value proposition around excluded and underserved segments and they're using technology to overcome some of the traditional barriers uh, that are associated with distribution, onboarding, a lack of data, and so on and so forth. So examples of these would be uh, Mybox Corporation, Moniz, Finsurf, Pentel, uh, Petal, and, and many other uh, providers. Then the second pathway is less direct, and so we call it inclusion as a positive externality. Those are firms that pursue digitization to make innovative operational improvements that allow them to better serve customers that are already served in the banking system. So they're competing with, um, with incumbents and uh, they're trying to get um, you know, out of, out of their customers. While those firms are implementing the technology and building those new capabilities that are meant to appeal to uh, included customers, over the time, those capabilities may also allow them to venture into new customer segments, new geographical areas, and may potentially become well-suited to serve uh, underserved and excluded customer segments as well. Whether they will or not, that's a different question, but they may be in, the, in a good position to do so. And so examples of this category would be Villabank, Newbank, Genius, uh, Tandem, Yolt, Monzo, and, and other. So you may be wondering now whether there are any any other examples and any uh, practical examples of where financial inclusion is already part of the value proposition or where we see digital banks doing something that is directly relevant to financial inclusion. And there are certainly many positive signs. So just to go through a few here, and these are just a few examples, we've heard many other brilliant uh, uh, examples too. So I mentioned Time Bank earlier, who've installed digital banking kiosks in over 500 grocery stores across South Africa, many of which are located in, in rural provinces. Uh, Willow Bank in, in Argentina, they, for 50% of their 35,000 account holders, that's, that's those customers' first ever bank account. Uh, in fin, with FinServe, for example, they've applied APIs to provide instant payments to farmers in Kenya, allowing them to, to be less reliant on intermediaries. Uh, Moniz, uh, the, the, a European banking provider, have used translation as a service in their customer service communication, which allows uh, their, their non-English speaking customers to, to communicate with their customer service personnel. MyBucks uh, in Africa have created a bespoke refugee camp banking, digital banking model, which they're currently using in Malawi and, and might be rolling out elsewhere too. And then uh, Solaris Bank have an EKYC platform to facilitate digital identification for, for customer onboarding. Uh, and finally, Petal uh, uh, using alternative data to, to make better uh, credit approval decisions. All of these could be quite powerful uh, indicators for financial inclusion within the digital banking space. Excellent. So are there any, any data also to show? Yeah, we've certainly got some numbers. Uh, so evidence from our interviews indicate that digital banking can certainly strip out costs. Uh, customer acquisition costs typically seems to fall to around 5 to 15% of that of a traditional retail bank. Uh, additionally, digital banks are able to spend just a fraction, one to five percent of the cost of operating a branch uh, by using alternative distribution channels, such as the, the kiosk I mentioned at Thai Bank. Uh, thirdly, and finally, uh, in terms of CTI, cost to income, uh, this can be 20 plus percent lower for banks serving customers through digital channels when compared to serving them through uh, traditional banking channels. All right. so. Um this is this is basically what we've done so far, and uh, this is based on our, our disk research, but also interviews with 
close to 50 individuals representing really different business models and, and, and different uh, kinds of players. Uh, we've come up with this uh, taxonomy, we've come up with the framework to sort of match the taxonomy with the financial inclusion barriers. Uh, but what we're trying to do n now is basically to get uh, a much more data about the actual uh, uh, operational efficiencies and um, what makes digital banks potentially um, better positioned to create a sustainable uh, business model that could uh, that could serve underserved and excluded clients. And so we're looking uh, to collect more more quantitative information, and we're also looking into developing a case studies where we could feature some of those providers in much more detail. So now, before we get to the Q&A session, we perhaps do have a couple of uh, minutes to go quickly over something that we would like to, to do, and that is to get, your, the, get a sense of what you think about digital banking and financial inclusion. So if I may ask you to go to Slido, that, that is uh, www.sli.do, um, if you can do it, you are, I assume, on your computer or on your phone, so uh, you should be connected. Uh, if you type that address, you will see the screen, as you can see it now on your screens, where you can type CGAP in capital letters and to hit join. And that should, that should uh, bring you to a polling system where we ask you first whether you agree with the proposed taxonomy of the four big uh, big buckets, uh, and uh, then the specific variations or, or types of um, digital banks that we talk about. So I'd like to ask you uh, if you can and if you've managed to, to get into Slido to vote now. And we should be able to see uh, the data coming. All right, so we have people voting. Um, we have 19 people voting. Let's let's give it a couple of more seconds. Uh, sometimes it takes a little more time to download or or to get to that page. So uh, let's see, maybe 10 more seconds for whoever wants to cast vote. Um, all right, so so far it seems like uh, the taxonomy resonates with most of our audience, which is which is a good news uh, for us. So let's stop here and but stay on the Slido uh, Slido side. And we would like to ask you another question, which is, do you think that digital banking can actually improve financial inclusion? <clears throat> So again, use the same same thing. Uh, hopefully, the question actually automatically popped on your screen, so it should be easier now to to vote. Um, all right, so we're now getting more people engaged, which is great. All right, so ten more seconds. Um, Excellent, uh, excellent, thank you very much. And the last thing that we want to do very quickly is to ask you, so again, stay on, on, on the website, what aspects of digital banking are most relevant to financial inclusion in, 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 in your view? And here it's an open question, open-ended question, so one word that you think is particularly relevant in this combination of digital banking and financial inclusion. Could be technology, could be cloud computing, could be um, EKYC. Anything that you know comes to your mind. We just uh, connectivity uh, might be another example. So um, again, let's uh, let's wait for a couple of uh, seconds so that people can type. Um, it, it it takes a little more time uh, than the previous ones because you need to type uh, the answer. And if you're in a mobile device, that <laughs> may take a little more time. But I see that we've got uh, 22 answers for now. With um, regulation, banking, now costs, costs and regulation uh, featuring uh, very prominently transparency. So 10 more seconds um, to see who's the winner. 
uh, but I can tell that regulation is is featuring quite prominently, and uh, we've got some questions questions on regulation as well. So we'll get to that point. All right. Well, I, I think it's pretty pretty clear that regulation is an important um, important challenge to address. And then we have other things such as interoperability, mobile uh, costs, uh, reach, services, and so on and so forth. So. Thank you very much for participating in this in this poll, and let me try to go back to um, let me go back to our slides. Um, all right, so we've received a number of questions. Uh, many of those questions are are really going beyond uh, digital banking and are related to. The, the concept of financial inclusion generally and how to serve excluded and underserved uh, underserved people and this this is probably not not uh, surprising so um, we'll try to uh, answer them as well but let me start with the question that was specifically focused on regulation um, so somebody asked and I'll try to just find it um, so Catherine uh, Larcomb asked. Many central banks do not allow banks to use cloud-based core banking systems. Do you expect this to change in the near future? And I think this is a question that really touches upon a big, um, big topic uh, where there is a capability that is uh, available to many banks or many players generally, but some of them can't simply use it because there are um, regulatory restrictions or there are requirements such as data residency. Um, you know, it's very hard to predict whether this will change, but I believe that many regulators are now looking really seriously into this issue and trying to understand what can be lost if the regulation is too strict and doesn't allow providers, especially in some areas, uh, to use cloud computing services or to use cloud computing services that store data in, in other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. I think concepts such as regulatory sandbox may potentially help regulators to to keep up with what's happening and, and sort of test um, the cloud computing and get comfortable with that concept be before they move uh, move ahead. One example is the Central Bank of Philippines, for example, allowed uh, a small scale testing of cloud computing based core. Um, banking system in the rural areas of the Philippines to kind of see how it works, how resilient it is, and so on and so forth. And then based on the, this test and learn approach, they've decided to allow cloud computing and, and carve out rules around data residency so they do not restrict cloud-based use of uh, uh, core banking systems. Okay. So then there is a question on um, Cooperatives and how they how they can benefit. Um, I mean, I will I will try to sort of reframe that question a little bit uh, to bring it a little bit to a higher level. Um, so it's uh, Daoud Abu Yudom who asked, to what level cooperatives could be successful acting as mobile money agents in rural areas? What would be their business model? So let me just generalize this question a little bit more about how. Uh, cooperatives can benefit from what's happening in banking with digitization, et cetera, in the first place, and then maybe let's let's focus on this uh, agent-specific question. So we see that especially the banking as a service providers are now looking into, as they are trying to expand to other markets, they're looking into the new opportunities beyond fintech startups. And I think many of them are discovering that um, Cooperatives, local banks, smaller institutions are um, are potentially interesting market because they're struggling with uh, high cost and manual processes, et cetera, and they can perhaps benefit quite a bit from the banking as a service providers. Now, your question about uh, mobile money agents, I mean, this is, this is uh, an interesting question and it also has to do with regulation. Uh, I can imagine a scenario where uh, small cooperatives can actually act as a mobile money agent. Um, I don't see why. An interesting question in this context is whether regulation can be designed in a way that agents can establish their uh, independently operating models and not necessarily to be operating as agents for the principal, 
but where they can actually become an independent businesses offering a distribution and advisory and intermediation services to a number of providers, be it the mobile money uh, operators or, or other types of entities that are um, in need of distributing channels. So we also had a question from Andrew and Medu um, around uh, who are the major targets for the various categories of service providers? Are we talking about bottom of the pyramid or, or is it bottom up or, or a top bottom, top bottom approach? Uh, I think this really goes back to the digital banking pathways that Evo touched upon where we're seeing some providers actively targeting the bottom of the pyramid in the first instance as their, um, as their initial target market and then possibly looking to expand beyond the bottom of the pyramid. And then we're seeing many other and probably many more providers who are targeting a more middle income or top of the pyramid type uh, uh, market with the potential then to explore the uh, bottom of the pyramid segment later on. Um, so it's an interesting uh, separation that we, we, we've, we've seen. Uh, and I think that slide that Eva was talking through earlier uh, goes, goes into that in a little bit more detail. Yeah. Um, then we have a question from Anurag Rastogi. Um, are the leading commercial banks thinking anything around creating marketplaces for smaller financial institutions, including banks to offer more innovative products to the bottom of the pyramid? So we don't see, uh, we, we have not seen this specific focus on allowing smaller financial institutions to plug into marketplace and, and offer, um, offer uh, products to bottom of the pyramid to be a mainstream. But I would say that, that FinSurf and what they're doing might be a good example where they actually created an open API platform that allows different, uh, different providers to plug in and to actually uh, serve, um, for example, farmers or smallholders in rural areas uh, in Kenya. But more generally, we see a lot of the marketplace players or those players who are thinking about marketplace uh, targeting smaller finance or niche providers, not necessarily smaller, but niche providers, providers who can offer their service to, to, the, to their best, sort of to offer really a world-class service in a one specific particular area, because plugging them into a marketplace then makes, uh, makes a lot of sense uh, where customers can just get access to really top-notch value propositions from a variety of players across uh, different markets in one, one place. Um, we also received questions from Serge Bupta. Uh, we're all talking uh, about marketplaces. Isn't their model a potential disruption as opposed to innovation to the regular digital banking model presented? Yes, so this is a question that touches upon another work stream that we have around modularization of finance. How the value chains in financial sector are changing as a result of new types of business models emerging and new types of players coming and, and uh, some of them being very narrowly focused in terms of product or customer segment. And so, if you will, this can be, and, and then there's this concept of bundling and, and uh, I mean, unbundling and rebundling, um, which some people talk about. So, if you see it from this perspective, it may be disruptive in, in, a, in a way, um, and, and it's, it's certainly uh, a trend that is shaking up the, the industry because it's sort of regrouping around new, uh, new ways of delivering financial services, new models of sharing revenue, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the question really is, um, from the customer point of view, whether this is a disruption or whether this is just bringing uh, more efficiency and, and, and better services. We've also had quite a few questions on uh, financial illiteracy as a barrier or poor numeracy uh, from, from a few different people. So we had limited financial capabilities as one of our demand side barriers, and um, I, I guess that would fit, fit within there. Well, so one thing we've, we've seen, and, and there's a lot of um, a discussion about, is automated personal financial management, uh, where uh, these personal financial management tools might automatically make financial decisions on the part of uh, of a customer, and this could be a powerful uh, tool in the future for um, customers that don't uh, necessarily have uh, extensive financial capabilities. I mean, that's that's very much in the future, but but it's certainly something that, that that's in development. Yeah. 
Several questions received on infrastructure. So um, is infrastructure a barrier? What kind of minimum infrastructure needs to be in place? Well, you got a sense, I guess, and, and you know from your experience that there is clearly some minimum infrastructure that has to be in place. And many of those digital banks that we've talked about uh, require some level of connectivity, online connectivity, and uh, some level of smartphone penetration. And many of the players we have interviewed, um, when thinking about their expansion, they would mention some minimum infrastructure being in place. So I, I think this is really uh, a big topic and something to, to tackle. But we see that the trend is that connectivity is increasing over the time, and the smartphone penetration even though not necessarily overwhelmingly raising in all the markets, it is constantly growing. Um, speaking of connectivity, there are some interesting projects. Uh, you might have heard about Google Loons uh, that is being tested in Kenya, for instance, where Google is sending balloons into stratosphere to, uh, to flow there and to distribute Wi-Fi signal. Um, there is another project by Elon Musk that is called Starlink. The idea is to send around 12,000 satellites to rotate around the Earth and cover pretty much every inch, inch of our planet by Wi-Fi signal. There are projects such as uh, Facebook Zero, Facebook Basic, if you will. So we see some efforts to improve connectivity, and I'm personally very hopeful that it will ultimately translate into a better infrastructure, uh, both in terms of connectivity and smartphones as well. But yeah, I agree, this is one big uh, big uh, challenge to solve, combined with the regulatory framework. Because again, throughout our conversations, we've got a sense that regulators are not equally open to those new banking models or new business models more generally across different jurisdictions, with uh, some regulators being actually extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. We've been told in several markets that regulators were eager to help to bring new players to life and to the market. Whereas in other markets, um, you know, either because of the cloud computing or technology more generally, or other reasons, regulators are far more skeptical and not willing to to uh, embrace the change that's happening. Mm. And on a similar similar note, we had a question from Jackie Kitibwa uh, on why we didn't include restrictive regulations as a barrier to financial inclusion. Um, it's clear from that Slido poll as well that that this is what many of you see as the primary. Uh, challenge or, or barrier uh, to, to, to um, digital banking um, sort of taking off in emerging markets. Uh, the answer to that is because uh, within the CGAP framework, there was a section uh, on uh, infrastructure slash regulatory barriers, uh, but we didn't include it uh, just because we felt that the banking business models in themselves wouldn't necessarily be able to overcome uh, some of those um, infrastructural or, or, or regulatory challenges. I mean, there may be an indirect link, but but it's less tangible. Yeah. Yes, then we have a question uh, that asks about M-Pesa. Um, and I'd be personally very disappointed if M-Pesa didn't come up. So uh, thank you, Dan Uko, for, for asking this question. So we have mobile banking, M-Pesa in Kenya, that is synchronized to main bank accounts and access to money is both ways, either through phones or banks. So would it qualify as a full digital banking system? Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time debating about uh, those specific models, and as Sean mentioned, there are some models that are sort of in between. Uh, but for us, M-Pesa uh, is, for now, probably the, the, the limited purpose bank. But we've seen uh, M-Pesa moving towards, you know, plugging in some other partners, for instance, to launch Meshwari. And so if we see this trend going and evolving over the time, we would be inclined to say that Mbesa actually might be a marketplace approach where they're having a core value proposition being their, their mobile money account, but moving into plugging other partners and offering other types of services. Now, I do appreciate that we have a lot of questions that we have not answered yet, and some of them we have not answered intentionally because other CGAP colleagues would be better positioned to, to do so. But I have included my email address, and I'm going to run the risk of getting uh, overwhelmed by the reactions, but actually the more the merrier. Feel free to use this email address to follow up. I'd like to talk to some of you because I've seen that you're actually working on some of these areas that we've covered and you're doing interesting stuff. So please feel to reach out and, uh, and share your experience. Also, I've seen some disagreement with our taxonomy or with, with our views on financial inclusion and digital banking. Very happy to engage in more detailed conversation about your views. 
And also, if you have a specific questions that we have not answered and you want them to be answered, please, again, use this email address, get back to me. I'll be also happy to either answer it myself or, or connect you to my other colleagues that may be better positioned to do so. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this uh, webinar. Uh, we've enjoyed this experience. Thank you for your engagement. A lot of questions received. Thank you for your participation in Slido. And as mentioned, the, the, the material will be sent to all of you. It will be posted online, so you will have a chance to get back to it and, and review it at your own pace. Thank, thank you, you very much. for joining. Thank yeah. you, Eva, and thank you, everyone.